know we cover a ton of information each week. And if you miss a series, know that all of the videos are available on the Tory Birch Foundation YouTube channel. So feel free to go back, rewatch, and know they're there for you. We've of course been following along closely for the federal relief funding updates. It feels like they change every week. And want you to know that if you're still figuring out PPP in our second episode, we really take you from beginning to end on everything you need to know about PPP funding. So check that out. If you have reached out to a lender and haven't heard back, please know that there are now more lenders in the ecosystem. So there are the fintechs of the world like PayPal, Cabbage, Square. There are also CDFIs that can be a great resource for you, community development financial institutions, as well as women business centers. We will circulate those links so you can easily find these resources. And we, we want you to know you're not alone. There are great resources out there for you. An important update on PPP is the SBA has finally released the long awaited loan forgiveness guidelines. So check out sba.gov. Um, there's an application on that site. We will be sharing more information as we get more information on that topic, so check back. And on other news, I'm delighted to share that this morning we've launched our email and e-commerce toolkit, which was designed to supercharge your online presence and online business. So check that out and let us know what you think. We'd love to hear from you. So now on to the main event. Each session we ask for your feedback and we design around that feedback. So we heard two things loud and clear from you. One is what does marketing and communications look like in this crisis? And two, bring back marketing guru Ramon Ray. So Ramon is here. We're delighted. Hey, Ramon is it's so good to see you, Ramon. We're so excited about this Ask Me Anything with Ramon. Ramon, you are a four-time entrepreneur. You've sold two companies. You're an entrepreneur in residence at Alice, best-selling author. You name it, you've done it. So we're so thrilled to have you here so people can ask you anything, including why you love burnt Excited to be here. I'm a little nervous. Bacon. It'll be great. If somebody asks me that question, if somebody asks me, I will answer it. <laughs> great, great. And um, so we've received so many thoughtful questions from our community. So Ramon and I will get to as many of those questions as possible. I will also monitor the Q&A chat, which is down below. So please don't be shy. We want to hear from you. We want to answer your questions. So use this as an opportunity for you, okay? So Ramon, let's get right down into the, um, all the key topics. So okay. let's start with the first one, which was so clear when reading all of the questions that came through that our community is first and foremost concerned about their customers and they want to be sensitive in the midst of this crisis. So let's talk about tone. Mm. Okay. I had a great question here. Um, someone asked, as cities and stores begin to open, how do we promote sales messages and our business without seeming tone deaf to this crisis? So how That's do people balance this? Yeah, very, very good question. I can't wait to hear your thoughts as well, Gabrielle. And also, I just want to say thank you, Gabrielle, for having me. Thank you to you and your team. Thank you to the Tory Birch Foundation. And a shout out, even though, you know, I can't see you all, I know y'all can see me, to the community that's here in the Tory Birch Foundation community and beyond. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thanks for asking me to come back. It's a pleasure to be here and spend this hour with you all and serve and, and help answer. So, uh, Gabrielle, listen, back to that uh, question. I think there's a few things. And, and, and just to underline, Gabrielle, as you know, I am a small business owner. So I'm going through this, I'm hurting, thinking, I have, I have customers as well, and I have to think the same thing. So a few things that I would say, and, and what we've done, I think that works, is we've divided our customers into two and a half types of customers, maybe three. There's some customers, I think, who are just doing bad. And, uh, you know, and we do reach out, 
sometimes one by one, but we're aware of what I'm trying to say, whether it's emotionally or mentally, that some of this type of customer, they're doing bad. They've had to shut their business down. They've been sick. They've had family who's died. This is not the time to touch them and nag them and ask that. But to say, we hope you're okay and hope you're feeling better. And these are the times where family is better suited to help that. I, I, you know, I'm not going to probably go to Gabrielle's house and, you know, clean. I could, <laughs> if we were like that, but you know, there's, <laughs> there's that type of customer. Other type of customer are the customers that are relatively, Gabrielle, doing very well. So you can, you're still empathetic to all, but it's okay to say, we're glad you guys are okay. We're glad your business is growing. I don't know. Do you need to order more pens? You know, whatever it may be, uh, we're glad. And this middle customer now, be ginger with. They're getting their PPP loans. They're getting their other type of loans. They've had to lay off three people, but they still need your services. So if that's helpful, Gabrielle, I think it's training your staff and everybody, be sensitive, be aware. The lady you're talking to could have just had her cousin die. She could have just had her uncle who she couldn't fly to another country to. So I think if we're aware of that, but really it's by dividing that customer list and being aware of it. Great, Ramon. And there are so many wonderful questions coming through. Um, someone's asking about the right sales pitch right now. So we're obviously being inundated with content because we're all digital. Um, so how do you craft the right digital message to, to really show your value and provide the benefit that your customers are looking for and stand out amongst a lot of really great content and a lot of really great sales pitches? How do you stand out? Sure. And what I'm going to try to do, Gabrielle, but you guide me to answer my questions a little shorter to even get more questions in, but you tell me if you want me to go longer. So if I'm being brief, it's only, you know, to get more in. But here's what I'd say a few things. I, okay, good, good, good. So my point of this, Gabrielle, and it depends on industry and there's a lot of variables, but here's what I would say, and thanks for asking the question, is that um, A, marketing has not changed. Marketing is marketing. You always want to be empathetic, know who you're talking to, know who the customer is. I think two, hopefully by now we're two months into this, three or four months for some industries, you've already been sharing that you care. So I think at some point, not that you're gonna stop caring, but every message you don't have to say in challenging times like this, I'm not being cold, I'm not being unsympathetic, but at some point it's time to, to evolve that message. So my point is, if you've been doing this already, it's okay going back to my, I don't know, my pen example, you know, that hey, 30% off this summer as, as you consider you know, if the, if the kids go back to school, see what I did? I paused. I said, when the kids go back to school, we don't know that yet. That's the thing to be careful with. You may not want to have 30% off a pen uh, back to school sale. That's a bit tone deaf, but you can still say 30% off if you buy it today, you know, and we, and we hope you're well, something like that. And Ramon, that's a great um, call out on discounts, which is a, a very heated topic. Do you, are you recommending that people offer discounts? I've heard um, both sides. What, what's your take on promos during this time? Is it beneficial to you in the long run? Or what's your, sure. what are your thoughts on, on discounts? In fairness, and I use the discount on that because I think it depends on what it is. Some industries, as you know, for worse or for bad, and we could have a whole session on that, are discount driven buy one, get one free. That's the industry they're in. I think we're not going back. But however, as my friend Mike McCallowitz says, his book, Profit First, I'm a firm believer, Gabrielle, profit, profit, profit. So I'd rather if I had to lose or put customers somewhere else, if my profit is growing. So no, I'm not a firm believer in discounting, but I use that example. If it's a low margin product and it's volume, 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 then I'm not so rigid on discounting, but now say for me as a speaker or a consultant, you're a lawyer, attorney, services like that, I, I discount less quickly and try to offer other things, if that makes sense. I like that for other things. I've heard um, someone was saying recently that it's better not to offer discounts because then you train your customer to expect it. Um, and it's better to offer free services that are limited for certain times, if you can, um, to get that customer in for a lifetime, right? So I think that's Correct. important to note because it's, it's easy to react to this crisis and think, I need to discount my services, just get people to click, and that might not serve you in the long run. Correct, correct. And, um, and if those were digital businesses, Gabrielle, digital businesses, they can test it. You know, if it's all digital, they can do an A-B testing, et cetera. And in 24 hours, this worked. Now, 
if you're, you know, like us, as it were, a business where there's some calls and emails, a little different, but digital businesses, the numbers don't lie. And you can test, to your point, right? right? right. So Lindsay right. asked a great question. Um, what's your advice and how to communicate to customers to shop in store at local businesses versus online shopping? And I assume Lindsay's in a state where this is now permitted. Um, and just a side note, we're going to be talking about what um, the path to reopening looks like in our webinar next week. So Lindsay, definitely check that out. But any advice, Ramon, on how to get people back in your store um, from a marketing perspective and how do you communicate safety to your customers and so on? Absolutely, Lindsay, thanks for asking the question and feel free to follow up and let me and Gabrielle know what your business is, what you're doing. If I'm in your state, I'll come by. Um, and I do mean that. Um, so <laughs> here's what I would say. One, the local um, ice cream shop down the block, as I'm pointing here, two miles down the road, did something very ingenious. Gabrielle, they put a big sign, brand new sign that said, we're open. Because I was wondering, you know, this is in times like this, are they open as ice cream shop? So that's one, especially that foot traffic, do something different because they had the same old sign for the past 4,275 years. I noticed the simply white background, red lettering. So one, just be obvious. I learned that from Steve Harvey's, uh, one of his writers, his comedic writers. He just said, state the obvious. Two, um, communicate, communicate, communicate. If you don't have an email list, build one. But hopefully you have a little database of your customers email or texting. Hey, just so you know, we do have new hours, but we are open. And three, update those Google or Yelp or otherwise listings. That's important. Bigger brands are doing it. You look on and say Sam's Club, Walmart, they're saying new hours. I think there's some ways to do it, you know, on those platforms. So that's a big deal. Um, you, Uber Eats and Seamless, our hours are. So I think those four things I would do, just communicate. Yeah, sometimes we overcomplicate our process instead of just being obvious, right, and direct. So Lindsay answered our question, which is she owns a bridal boutique in Connecticut, and today's her first day back. So congratulations, Lindsay, and we know there are so many couples that um, are eager to get married this year, so I, I, we wish you the greatest success in your reopening. Indeed, Indeed. and I did uh, answer the question... Gabrielle, about the cleaning. I didn't answer that. I just wanted to add and say, just, uh, it's important to say that too. I can go in long, but just important to say that, you know, we do this, we do that. We're cognizant. Uh, we wash our, our doorknobs ten, three times a day, whatever. So can't hurt to get a little sign and communicate that because it means me and Gabrielle are going into Lindsay's store. Trust me, when Gabrielle touches the door handle, she's thinking, trust me. If she doesn't say it, <laughs> if I open this door handle, what happens? So communicate that too. Yeah, we're all very sensitive to safety. I've even um, seen some really smart brands offering masks to their customers in case a customer doesn't come in with a mask. So think ahead, think strategically. I love this question from Alexandra. She's asking, for new college graduates, do you have any advice for the hiring process during this crisis, especially um, dealing with with companies in positions of power. So I would say, Alexandra, from a marketing perspective, so many small businesses are looking for really bright stars, right, Ramon, that can help with social media that might be more advanced than some of us older folks at this point in sure. social. Do you have anything to add to that, Ramon? No, I love it. I think that's great advice. And I would just say the big thing, Gabrielle, is everybody has to think different. You know, there's a, there's, everything is in buckets. And I know some people who I work with in, in different communities, you know, they're I have my resume, I have my cover letter. No, the whole world's changed. Rethink your, your, everything you're doing. And that could be a whole nother webinar to itself if you haven't already done it. But I think your advice was spot on, Gabrielle. This is a great question and similar theme, which is any advice that you can give regarding marketing to hire people during this time. We are an essential service truck driving and they're having difficulty hiring people. And how to market yeah, that? that. Right. And I think two things that comes to mind, Gabriel, A, is it difficult hiring the right people, which we don't have to address, but I think there's something there, the right people. And I think the second thing I often find, Gabriel, if it's, if it's a problem that you're not getting people in, I, I, I find in me, because I am a marketer, that people just don't market good enough. You, I think of a truck, that same sign has been there for 457 years. It's still dirty. Nobody can see it. The last digit is whited out, you know, over time. Things like that, Gabrielle. So I think also, remember your website. Does it look boring or does it look inviting? Does it have, you know, bring your kids to driving a truck drive? Vroom, vroom. <laughs> it may sound corny, may sound dumb, but trust me, when there's 10 companies 
and you're the one that says, bring your kid and let them honk the horn. Who's, what company do I want to work with? Yours. So I could go on, but that's just one or two. If it helps, you got to be different. Make sure your website reflects that because many people, I think, Gabrielle, we don't smell ourselves. We're so used to something, so used to what we're doing. On my website, my contact form wasn't working. How would I know my contact form wasn't working? Do I go to my website and contact myself? No. So have a feedback system built in just kind of to check stuff, you know, or, 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 oh, the telephone number was wrong on the back of our truck. Hence, for the last three months, calls didn't come in. That's a great point, Ramon. And something that I know we're really big at the foundation is focus groups and experiment, 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 and get feedback, which is how we're designing each session. So feedback is critical. Um, Terrell is asking a really great question. How can you host an event while trying to obtain sponsorship without being insensitive to the current pandemic? Um, so Terrell, I'm not sure if that's an in-person event or an online event, but Ramon, what do you think? Sure, I think it's a great question. And Gabrielle, let me know when four hours is up because I can talk on this all day. <laughs> I'm going to see how Gabriel holding a sign <laughs> or he's going to mute me. No, but really, that's something I do well, Gabrielle, as you may know. I had about a month ago my own uh, Survive and Thrive Summit. We had over 2,000 people and sponsors. So this is something right in my wheelhouse, very particular. So the point, Terrell, and thanks for asking, is I think many of us, I find, we're battling with our own emotions and our own limitations. And I say that respectfully. So I know we've had sickness people. So again, I'm not going to keep saying that. But after we move on, there's companies still spending money. Companies are still doing advertising. So we need to get in that. And I think it's a great question. Be sensitive, do ask. Again, I'll pick on Gabrielle because she's right in front of me. Gabrielle, how are you? How are things okay at the foundation? Great, let's pretend she worked for a big brand, you know, as, as it were. Then I can dive in. Glad you're well now. Here's my proposal. It's only $40 million for a big event. You know, you get what I'm trying to say. The point is, there's companies spending money and don't be afraid to then, if everybody's okay, and she's good, she, Gabrielle has budget, she has to still spend that money, why not with you? That's a great point, Ramon, and I, I think this really hits on our, our first key topic to focus on, which is the tone, right? And um, in the beginning of our session, we were both looking at slides moving around, and I think, when I think of leadership right now and marketing right now, it's essentially improv. Right, so you have to just be present, pay attention to what's going on with who you're pitching, to your point, how their family's doing, mm -hmm. how are their employees doing, but still ask the question because to your point, people are still hosting events. Um, most of them are online. I know Dana um, from California is asking, as a nonprofit, how do you market uh, primarily event-based um, initiatives? Uh, do you see fall events going into hybrid, part in person, part at home? What's your take on that, Ramon? Absolutely. Um, thank you for asking the question. I think that absolutely. I was just talking to a nonprofit, a local chamber. They're going through the exact same problem as I'm sure tens of thousands, Gabrielle, whatever the nonprofit market is, hundreds of thousands in the U.S., is that they have their big one-day gala in the fall. They're like, we don't know if we can have it, we should not. So yes, I think this is where, again, think different, think different to the nonprofits. And I would say, drive home that message even more, drive home while you're valuable even more, showcase even more the value that you have. And then yes, you need to become a scientist of online events. Most people are not, but as a professional speaker, you know, I'm a member of the National Speakers Association. So behind the doors for our industry, we're getting into double camera shots, video shots, drones inside, weird, cool stuff to kind of up the game. And also remember, one big part of a virtual event is just hosting it. So you can have all the fancy stuff, but even if you want to hire or work at somebody, you know, there's tons of people in the nonprofit world who can help host it. That's something I'd say, but it's something, yes, Gabrielle, all nonprofits, most of them, I'm guessing, have their annual gala in the hotel, you know, the shrimp and cheese or whatever it is. That's going to be hard to have this year for sure. It'll be hard to have, and, it, and you'll have to think through, will the people you're inviting be comfortable attending, right? So it's both sides. Um, and as we know, we can all be more digital and we're, we're surviving through digital. So that's certainly a solution. So Ramon, I'm looking at your sign behind you, do it with passion or not at all, um, which certainly leads me to this really heartfelt question from Jill. She just 
has been working on her new company. Mm -hmm. um, she's been working on it for two plus years, startup phase. She is now delayed on the launch, starting a GoFundMe campaign to raise funds for PPE. And she even used her factory to make nearly 10,000 isolation gowns wow. as a donation, which goes to my point that our community is so resilient and so sensitive to the needs of others. Um, she's trying to think through, she's working around the clock, her timing, she feels it couldn't have been worse, not sure her brand will be alive after she gets through this. So what advice do you have for people that are just in the thick of it, were getting ready to launch and now don't know what to turn and what to do as far as marketing their new business? No, Jill, listen, thank you. And I think you're in the same boat as a lot of other people. A few things I would say, uh, and, and it's, it's a big choice to pick. You know, Do you go forward and risk that and lose the time and money, or do you stop pause, restock, and change. I was talking to a friend of mine, uh, Deep D, and I'm just saying it because it's public, her company, Food to Eat. It's a catering company. Some of you may know it. I mean, she's in the thick of this. So Jill, my point being with you is I think don't let the emotions cloud any judgment you make. This is my best advice, I think. Is there an addressable market of customers? Have you had any customers before? What do you look at the economist? Read things like, you know, follow Tory Burch Foundation, but of course, the economist business week, get out of your own industry and think of what the economists are doing with their best guessing, where place things are going, and then make an educated guess. If you think there's a future, I'd say plow through. I just saw a movie, uh, Gabrielle with Shackleton, the guy who went to South Arctic, wherever, somewhere in the Arctic, the cold area, you know, <laughs> back in the day. So my point being, plow through. But if you think that Jill's done everything she can, and there's going to be no need for red cups. Nobody's going to ever drink coffee again. And, you know, the whole industry for red cups and coffee and liquid is done. Well, you may have to do something different. But I think if you feel there's a, the numbers are saying, it looks like we have a good chance if we do this. It may hurt us a bit. We may have to let go of some people, reduce income. But we think we can do it. Also, don't forget your network, Jill. And I found that's a powerful, we're all six degrees from people. So can you leverage that network? Hey, you know, Gabrielle, I know you know so-and-so at the local hospital. I really, Gabrielle, I really need to have lunch with Dr. So-and-so to get this $10 million contract. It's certainly a time of reimagination, Ramon. And uh, when I think about our Tory Birch fellows, there are so many that started with one direction and have really pivoted and are still thriving. Um, forgive my language, but shit that I knit is one of our, our Tory Birch fellows. And she is now doing um, at home knitting nice. boxes and is absolutely thriving. So the point is, Use your imagination, you may pivot, um, and you may come out even stronger, right? So keep going is the point. Absolutely. Right? Um, now, let's, let's talk a little bit about reopening because so many people are asking questions about that. Mm -hmm. How much or how little should you share with customers about what you're doing to reopen safely? I think it's good. And I think, of course, it all depends on your customers. But I'm a, I'm a firm believer on it's better to be more transparent and open. I think that can't hurt you. Now, you want to be careful of context and lens. We're in the world of Instagram, Snapchat, and Twitter. You know, do you say something or do something that somebody can misconstrue publicly? But I think the more you're communicating, as, as much as you can, if the line's here, maybe you come up to here. You know, never lie. But you want to come up to as much as you can and say, here's where we are. We're being as safe as we can. And I find that apology works quite a bit. Being able to tell the customer or tell people, oh, so sorry, we didn't realize that. So, sorry, Joe didn't clean the table right or whatever the first time. Forgive us. We'll do better. I think that goes a long way. But I think as far as reopening, communication, communication. And if you can, communicate beforehand. Me and my wife went on a cruise two years ago. The night before, we got this nice document that said, here's what's going to happen tomorrow. Great. We woke up. We knew there'd be long lines. No problem. We woke up. We knew there wouldn't be breakfast if we didn't go to X location at this time. No problem. So I think that's kind of the, what you want to expect. When you're coming, it's our first day opening. Please bear with us. Things may not be as, as you're used to, but we're going to try to serve you. That kind of thing I think is helpful. Yeah, we, we talked about this a little bit last week, Ramon, which is gone are the days of perfectly polished anything right? Yes. And so we all need to be flexible. This question I thought was really just so um, spot on. 
this person runs a physical therapy business and they want to know how do we present ourselves to prospective patients with pre-existing conditions that the benefits of attending a PT appointment in a safe, sanitized environment outweigh the risk of exposure to COVID. Wow, I love the question. And thanks for asking me, the epitome of health, who eats Twix peanut butter uh, uh, bars like four times an hour. I exaggerate a bit. We're going to get you healthy, Ramon. <laughs> Thank you, Gabrielle. But here's one thing that comes to mind. And again, all these questions could take longer to answer, but I'm going to try to give at least one good tip. And I think that video comes to mind for me for the PT company. Imagine, especially with that long tail education, it's, you know, whether a blog post and video where you're saying, uh, Let's say the owner's name is Jill. Hey, this is this is Jill PTE Incorporated. I know you're thinking blah 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 blah. Here's what our business does. Look, we wipe down the the weight machine every customer with this. Um, when your head goes back to relax, we haven't forgotten about your head. We wipe the headrest too. I'm just making that appear, but something like that, a little frequently asked questions video, which everybody can watch that goes to comfort people. So I think of video when I think of something that you have to explain to people uh, and, and you're making people feel comfortable. That's a great solution, Ramon. I love it. Um, so there are so many questions about trends and strategy right now from people that have had companies for 10 years to people who have just started. Um, so are there any new insights that you feel will be positive post COVID from a marketing perspective that we all should be keenly aware to. I think what I've seen, uh, uh, Gabrielle, is that this has caused all of us to change, not so much the marketing, but the message behind it. For example, I'm here in you know New Jersey area, and there's a local car company saying, come and shop for a car from your home. I've never seen so many messages now. We know it, it's a given, could be done, but clearly they've gotten whatever system they got, video, they're doing VR, virtual reality, things of that name, augmented reality, and they're integrating to the car buying process. And my point is, I think that's what it is. But my only caution is, don't go so far afield and leave people who still are in the, in the regular customers, what I'm trying to say. So Ramon shopping for shoes for his kid, and your store's open and I want to come into your store and try it on. Don't just keep sending messages. You can see the shoes in virtual reality. I may not be there yet. If that makes sense what I'm trying to say, Gabrielle, that think different, but you don't want to go off the wazoo. Just be geek out if your customers are not all there and most will not all be there. So leverage it, but don't go beyond where people are ready, if that makes sense. I, I think that's spot on. You don't want to hammer... Ha Put a hammer over people's heads on messaging. Um, I was just reading about the the importance of nomenclature during this time. So mm. what words you use, and when you use someone's name, which you're so good at doing, Ramon, um, it stimulates different parts of a person's brain. So if you can be personalized in your messaging, I think that's really important right now because we're we all want to hear our name. We're in isolation, right? And to hear from a brand that they know your name, I think will really set you apart. Um, so many great tactical questions here. One, uh, one person's asking about the best resources to forecast marketing trends. It's a great question. When you're developing a new product specifically. Yeah, sure. I mean, a few things I like, for, for example, if you're forecasting and doing things, Google is the most powerful search engine on earth. Again, whether you're using Microsoft products or not, but the point is, I think Google has a number of back end resources where you can get aggregate data on what's going on in the world. And I think that even though the, the offline world's important, whether it's Walmart or Sam's Club, whatever the, the offline stores are, my point is this tool everybody's using it and it can track everything. So there are ways you can go to the back end, Google's one, Yelp is one, and see those trends in your industry. I'll use my silly red cup example. People searched red cup and what did they do next? That's what you wanna know. They did red cup and was it coffee or tea? So if that helps what I'm trying to say, there are a number of, in my head, I could give, can't give more this second, but there are a number of analytical tools like that, free and fee-based, where you can mine the back end of Twitter, hashtags, things of that nature. Um, and don't forget your competition. A lot of companies are public, so you can go mine what they're doing and see what they're doing and kind of ride the wave with them as well. I love that. Uh, one idea that um, we've shared with our fellows is to, to look at your competitors 
look at their ratings, especially two and three star ratings to see like, what are the pain points that they're not able to satisfy that is an opportunity for you when you're creating a new, a new product or just in general competition with another business. So look at feedback over and over again, but yeah, there's so many great um, dashboards and, and toolkits out there, including some of the toolkits on our site. Not only are we getting great questions here, Ramon, but we're also getting great feedback. So okay. Métis said that um, one of her friends actually did a behind the scenes YouTube video regarding her company's sanitation practices to share with her customers. And I love that. So yeah, that's absolutely. a great idea from our community here. Um, a number of people are asking, what the best way is to acquire customers through social media, whether it be Instagram or Facebook? Oh, that must have been said by my mom or somebody. I can, Gabrielle, can you go get a cup of tea it or coffee? Your mom. No. <laughs> can you can you just go aside for thirty minutes? <laughs> We're actually getting it from so many people, so this will hit home for a lot. Here's the thing, and I can again. Here's here's my let me let me calm myself down and just answer the question. Uh, this is one of my gems. As some people in the audience may know, I'm all about celebrity CEO. My last book, all about building personal brand, building community. Here's my 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 quick sense. A seek to get a smile instead of a sale. That's one. That ties into build your fan base first. Social is not. Y'all, by the way, if y'all are tired of my red cup example, say we're tired, put tired in the comments if, if I should switch. Right now, I'm going to use a red cup. If you don't like it, I'm going to use the black uh, cup next. But red cup example. So I'm on social media. So you're, you're trying to say, how many like red cups? Do you like coffee? Which way should the handle be? This way or that may? This way or that way? My point is, I'm doing that just to get people to raise their hand that they're interested even in cups. If that makes sense what I'm trying to say, Gabrielle, I'm not trying to get to sell them anything. So for me, social is about the engagement. It's about the community building. It's about the, it happens to me all day. We talked offline, Gabrielle, how's my business going? It's taking off because I'm, as you, that's my thing, always Instagram stories to my audience. The point is educate, 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 use the power of video, build your list, build your list. As Gary Vee is famous of saying, not uh, jab, 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 right hook. Then as you build your list, as people get to know you, you then have the privilege and the right to then sell them. Before I educate and before I get close to you, I have no right to say, can you buy from me? But after I've talked about, hey, let me show you 10 ways to tie to, to fold a po pocket square. By the way, do you even like pocket squares? Hmm. Do you like orange? What would you do with this? Just blow your nose or put it in your pocket? All that cool stuff. Now over time, I can just ping you. By the way, buy two, get one free. No. Yeah, buy two, get one free. Something like that. So I hope that was a little bit helpful about social media. Absolutely. Um so you're obviously the content king, Ramon, and we had a great question come in for you asking for if you have a cheat sheet for daily or weekly tasks regarding communications and content. How do you lay out your content each week or each month? Sure. Mine is an undisciplined haphazard because so you shouldn't follow the Ramon Ray method. That's because me personally, I'm a haphazard person, meaning it's hard to explain, but haphazard, but like in my office, I can close my eyes. I know where everything is. So I'm an orderly but in that regard, but that's why I have a good team as well. I have a great team that helps me. But here's what I would say if it helps, two tips I'll give. Um, and one not directly answering the question, but free, F-R-E-A, frequency, relevancy, engagement, analytics. So that's one thing that I at least follow. I gotta be frequent, gotta be frequent. Gotta be relevant to my audience, relevant to my audience. Gotta be engaging. So I slip in a little bit of burnt pancakes here, there, slip in a, and slip in a um, you know, you know, I don't know. Hi, Tory Burch Foundation. How y'all doing? What's up? So slip in a little, you know, be, be a little bit. And then measure what works, what doesn't. So that's F-R-E-A. Uh, and regarding the content calendar, let me interpret it that way. I think it's important, especially if you're going to do this well. In a con and the reason I don't have a content calendar is because I'm pretty good at generating ideas. Everywhere I walk, everywhere I talk, my brain's on fire. But for most people, yes, have a content calendar. And one quick idea, maybe you say, Sunday nights, we're going to prepare our blog post. It'll go live on Monday. We'll rip that blog post apart for five days, Monday through Friday, different headlines, different subjects pointing back to that. Friday, we're gonna do a Facebook Live about the blog post. So that's kind of a simple strategy and there's so many way more, but those who are new to it, that you can leverage a piece of content and extend it multiple ways, because it does work. But build a fan base, capture emails, then you can sell. Love it. And I think my, my toddler's knocking on the door because he saw your- That's cool. Is that Ernie? 
Um, Mitzi demands a black cup example next. Okay. Okay, good. Love it. So other, um, you mentioned platforms to plan out your content. Do you have any favorites? I know later, mm -hmm. Buffer, great. What else is out there? That yeah, later is great. So let's pretend I was selling a black, uh, <laughs> a black uh, water bottle for Mitzi. <laughs> then here's the, here's the thing. So definitely I love Buffer. I love Hootsuite. There's Twitter itself. I have a tool I use called Agora Pulse, A-G-O-R-A, -A, Agora Pulse, competes with Try Lately, but both are so great. So that's regarding the social media. I think another tool that's great is a Qued, Q-E-U-E-D, something like that. Qued helps you repurpose and repost uh, content as well. So I think that for me, there's a number of tools that can help you just get more done in less time. I've just started using, ooh, Bomb Bomb. Bomb Bomb is cool, I bet. 20% of your audience knows it, and this enables you to do personal, because you can do a messenger or you can do a WhatsApp, a bomb bomb. Right? I can say, hey, Gabrielle, thanks so much for your time today. Thanks for everything you've done. And it goes to her email box. Okay, Ramon, so what? But it's not an email attachment. And guess what? A little GIF of me starting my message goes into Gabrielle's email box. So it's, and it does so much more. So that's bomb bomb. Um, I, I like Vimeo as well. Vimeo was way cool. Vimeo, people think it competes with YouTube. I don't think it does. It depends on your strategy. Some video I don't want to see, you know, some guy washing his Mercedes after my video. Hence meaning YouTube is about pushing things. So those are a few tools, but I can talk about tools all day for social and tech. Great. Well, we'll have to grab some links from you and circulate sure. them. Um, a number of people have asked about how do you differentiate your content for different platforms? So what do you do for Instagram versus Facebook versus Twitter or email, et cetera? Sure. When, especially Great. when you have a small budget, right? Great, great question. So I'm a firm believer, I guess half the world, probably everybody uses Canva, uh, which is a great tool to use to help. But remember, Canva's great, but you have to use it well, because if you suck at design, Canva will just help you make better sucky designs. So make sure you know what you're doing. Canva, Adobe, I think, makes some good tools as well. But point being, so here's what I do out of the main platforms. Twitter is a fire hose of stuff. You can tweet on Twitter three times an hour. Nobody would care because it's such a stream. And in a way you should, because people don't see it, meaning everybody doesn't. When I close my phone, there's 100,000 tweets now. And tagging people is good because they're all selfish. With this uh, event right here, right? Tori Birch Foundation would tag me, I'd tag them, and we get the word out, that's that. LinkedIn, I like two per day, or you know, definitely not more than that. And you can do on LinkedIn a post, as many of you know, or an article. Different ways to do it, and I won't go into the detail now. But tagging people is still good. Headlines, but be consistent on LinkedIn and you will build a following. Facebook, similar to Facebook, is kind of the image version or the TV version of LinkedIn. Facebook, again, you don't want to be blowing your feet up all day. But I find also, I write in the third party. So you'll see some of my posts. Well, I'm writing, Ramon is doing this today. That's kind of weird, Ramon. If Gabrielle's on her phone reading, why am I going to say the word I? No, I want her to say Ramon. If you, it's kind of weird, but just think about it if you guys don't get what I'm saying. Think about it. Um, uh, Twitter, uh, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn. Oh, Instagram. Instagram, definitely visual. Tory Burch Foundation does that well. Images, images. And my last thing I'll say, if, and, and again, it's, it's interesting, Gabrielle, because some people do this a lot, some people don't, meaning all these things we're saying, but stories. If you're not doing stories, soon it'll be old, but I think still stories are great because your story goes on the top of my feed and it's gone in 24 hours. So I built up a nice little audience of people who just watch my stories. They're short. I think they're fun. I, I amuse myself sometimes. And that's that. Love it, Ramon. So, so many great questions are coming through, um, specifically about social, social ads. Do you, are, are they effective? Should people spend money on them? What's your take? I think they are effective, but you need to get help doing it. Don't just hit that boost button because you'll probably lose money and pay way too much. So do a true native ad. That's one. Um, I find that Twitter ads are a lot cheaper than LinkedIn ads. But again, I'm never one to say do this way because it always depends. But do get help. Measure the analytics, but it does work. And I guess I would also say this is where my previous comments about building a fan base, because once you build a fan base, now it's cheaper and easier for me to market to you again and again, getting into retargeting and things, because it often takes more than once. I say, you know, hey, Jill, do you want to buy my, my black thermos? It's going to take me 10 times for her to really get the message. So yes, I like advertising online, but do it with thought and care. And also make sure you know your sales funnel. If you're, you know, just a speaker like me, or you're just doing it for 
for tiddlywinks and kicks, whatever that word is, like you're just doing it to do it, you're probably going to waste your money. But if you're dialed in and you know, hey, this thing, we're selling it for seven, we make it for two, blah, you know, you reverse engineering, I'm sure, I'm sure TBF, Tory Burch Foundation has things like that, then it's good because you know your cost per click and you can really build a machine. Every thousand dollars you spend, you're making 10,000. I think that's great, Ramon. And I would add test, test, test yes. uh, from a creative perspective. So I know at the foundation, we are always seeking advice. So before, and we don't really do ads, but before we post content, we'll ask entrepreneurs for their feedback to see if certain words really resonate or repel them, if certain colors work. So think of this as a test lab for you and do it all digitally. Host a Zoom, host um, an online focus group and get feedback in real time. So you're not wasting money on creative that doesn't connect for people, right? right. Um, and also important to note that Google um, is running a Google ad grants program right now for their current customers. So if you've spent money with Google in the past, check out that program because that could really boost your ad dollars um, as they run it. I think they're running it till the end of the year, but check out the Google ad program, it could be helpful. Sales versus social media following. Talk to us about that. You, you hit on the, the pipeline a bit, the funnel of sales. What's the difference? What should you really be investing your time in? Or are they connected? No, I love it. So sales is the art. Again, I'm only picking at Gabrielle. I'm saying her name, not because I always just say the name thing, but she's, again, she's right in front of me so I can pick on Gabrielle. So, um, so Gabrielle, I'm trying to sell her my cup. Sales comes in, Gabrielle, would you like to buy my red cup? Going back to red cup. Well, Ramon, uh, you know, I really don't have the money for right now. That's where the kind of things like sales comes in. How to overcome her objection. She said, not right now, so when? Did I have a follow-up appointment? She asked for a discount, and I can go on, but to me, those are those things with sales. Even online, sales funnel would be, um, they clicked, they came to the webinar, they asked for the audit, they asked for the free consultation. That's kind of sales funnel stuff, drawing people to separate them from their money in a fun way, as I say it. I think for me, the social part is just fan building. And this is what I do very well. For, again, because my business model is a little different. You know, I have a, a, a few larger checks. That's my model. I work at very large brands. So the point being is that for me, fan base, fan base, fan base, fan base, community. So if that's helpful. So I think it could work. So whether you're, let's say, talking to an accountant, an attorney out there, they can still build a fan base. But they should be very cognizant. Who asked for a consultation? Did they convert? If you're selling uh, the scarf, you know, like maybe an online business, then it's a little different because you need that volume. So both work, but I just think you need to look at the funnel to money a little differently, if that's helpful. That's great. And we'll get into website and e-commerce in a bit. Um, my big thing is always make, making sure you have as few clicks as possible to convert a sale. So don't overcomplicate to Ramon's point earlier, be obvious and be very um, straightforward with clicks. Social media burnout is a real topic. Um, we're all living it, experiencing it. How do you stand out in a, someone's feed when people are, are burnt out from, from content at this point? Great question. And man, wow. Like, again, Gabrielle, you sure you don't want to step away for an hour and let me just talk on this topic only? All yours. Go. <laughs> I'm see Gabrielle walk out of the room. No, but seriously, this is a great question. We are burned out. It's overwhelming, but let's be honest. I know you're on your phone for three hours tonight scrolling, aren't you? Yes, I can see all the hundreds of people nodding. You see what I'm getting at, Gabriel? So we say it, and it's true, it's burnout. But let's face it, all of us stop at the little boy, whatever is your fancy, the little boy, the little girl, the little cat, the graduation ceremony, the, the guy whose lawn sprayer went to, whatever, we all doing. So my point is how Ramon stands out, and you're right, is that A, remember, there are people who are in your community who want to hear from you. Remember that. I'm not for this one, that one. I have the Ramon or Smart Hustle and now Tori Birch uh, Foundation is welcoming me in. It's helping you all. So this community we have, and I'm not for everybody. Everybody don't like people with shaved head and glasses. That's cool. So that's one. And then two, you got to make it engaging. And when I say engaging, to your brand. If you're helping children who've been uh, abused, that's not a ha, ha, ha thing but you can still be engaging. And I say it like that so you get the point I'm trying to make. You can still be engaging, have a bold face or something that captures attention. On the other hand, for me, you look through my Instagram. I do stuff of me shaving. Now, it may seem offhand, but it all goes back to my core value, 
fun and do the right thing. So I hope that's helpful. Sometimes I feel, Gabby, that I go way off the reservation here. You can rein me back in. But my point is, good. My point is how to do that is A, remember that there's people who want to hear from you. Oftentimes they stop hearing from you when you're not serving them or you're a bit boring in the overall sense. I'm not saying you have to be ha ha ha, but boring in the whatever that means for you. And then three, add a little pop and sizzle in there. You know, again, you know, I try to take a picture like this. Sounds weird, but I'm just giving you a silly example for me. The red cup breaks up the color, as it were, you know, so things like that, or have a good headline. Um, you know, are you late? People who follow Ramon are going to want to, late for what? What are you talking about? Things like that. Love it, Ramon. Um, I feel like when we think about how do you stand out, it's also telling your story and not shying away from that. There's only one you. I know at the foundation, we love hearing stories of different business owners, what they're doing, what their story is. Um, so tell your story and there's no competition to that. Uh, Joyce is asking a really great question. There are a few questions in this one question, but she recently launched an e-commerce women's clothing company that sells high quality clothing all below $100, affordably chic. Um, she just launched right before COVID, her new website, and um, she's, she wants to know if Ramon thinks that she needs to refresh her website with new content as far as new clothing items or just keep it as is since I assume there hasn't been a ton of traffic to her site. And also would love to know thoughts on offering free shipping or offering discounts or different, um, different ways to tie people into their website. Sure. Thank you, Joyce. And congratulations. And feel free, Joyce, send me your link. Hey. I got a lady in my life. I may hit you up and buy some stuff. And I do mean that, Joyce. Hit me up. So, um, and congratulations on launching. So a few things, I'll say them rapid fire. I want to, I know there's time that's constricted here, but the point is, Joyce, um, A, um, I can't say refresh the website right now without looking at it and things of that nature, but refreshment in general, having things that change is helpful. Nobody likes something stale. But point two, Joyce, where I'd say, also put your energy into building your community, Joyce. Tory Burch Foundation has done this, right? It's not about, in Tory Burch, the brand, it's not about the clothing. Yes, matters, the quality and all those things. But I think, not having being a fashionista myself, but I think it's also how you feel. The community. Joyce is raising her flag that she represents this. Get all the people, as Seth Godin would say, who want to rally around that flag, Joyce. That's where I'd put your time and energy. So what video, what online events, what Instagram, what those things you're doing to, to call the ladies who want to be involved in the Joyce brand, as it were. So that's what I'd say, Joyce. Um, yeah, build community. I think that's the biggest thing you can do for your brand. And keep rocking it. Keep rocking it. And Joyce, I would say, always keep in mind your pricing. We think that it should be low cost. I'm just saying. If you tripled your prices, even though I know your brand is for 100, under $100, would you make more profit? I'm not saying do it. I know that you had your company, but just think about that because a big thing I see with entrepreneurs, they think they need to go lower, 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 when in fact the profit margin could be higher if they raise their prices. Great, Ramon. And how do you how do you tailor your social media? Is it still okay to tailor your social media towards different events, whether it be Father's Day or graduation or different things that might not have the same way that we used to celebrate it? How do you tailor that that information? Oh yeah, I like it. I'm, I think for sure, but I think always understand your audience. Using Father's Day as an example, if a lot of your audience doesn't have fathers or is not into Father's Day, be careful of just jumping on the bandwagon because everybody else is doing it. But I think, yes, tailoring, tailoring your message. And this goes back to being sensitive. You know what I mean? And remember, though, forever, we're not going to always be alone forever. So, yes, tailoring is important. And going back to even what I meant to say before, images, Instagram, square box, Facebook, square box, but a slightly different image, LinkedIn, a little longer, Twitter, a little, little longer. So keep in mind those things as well as you're doing that. But I think, yes, tailoring messages, but you have to think, how can I be different? How can I address people? How can I uh, speak the language that my tribe is hearing? Great. We're getting a number of questions about web specifically and e-commerce. So check out our toolkit. Um, Pam is asking if, if you have specific recommendations on how to set up an e-commerce site for small business. Do you recommend Shopify, Square? What it, what's your take? 
Yeah, two things. I would say the, the tool itself is a little less important than when you're starting out. But I think at the lower end, Shopify, Square, Wix even has e-commerce. Um, uh, GoDaddy has, has built in. And there's a number of WooCommerce, W-O-O, WooCommerce is off the chain ninja. So there's a number of great brands. If you want to scale up with that, you have things like Salesforce, NetSuite by uh, Oracle. Uh, Infusionsoft does some good e-commerce. So I think, yes, test out and I would go towards the one that has a nice community. I find, cause I, you know, I'm kind of a closet ninja at night, you know, digital person. I go to the online forums and get all my help. So that's what I would say. But two, be a, be a, be a ninja, be a master of SEO, Google keywords uh, uh, that somebody asked before about free shipping, things of that nature. So that's also where you want to put probably more time into because the platform itself, you know, it's the tool, make it look good but you want to be more of a science in how you're marketing it out, how you're treating customers. Is there a little pop-up before you leave the cart? Do you sure you want to buy? I've gotten emails from, oh, we noticed you filled your cart out halfway. Little things like that can add a few percentage points of margin to your overall business doing hacks like that. Love it. And any quick tips on e-commerce from a user experience perspective that you just live by certain rules or any, anything that our community needs to know when setting up an, an, a new website. Sure. Gabrielle, you said one best, uh, simplicity, simplicity, simplicity. That's one. Two, make sure you don't watch your website on a 400 inch screen. Most people using this. So it may look great. Oh, wow, look at the four, that, I went from four, four million to four billion in screen. And everybody's looking at it on this. So that's point two. And I think uh, three, don't forget the checkout. We learned from Amazon and other brands, right? People are rocking that checkout experience as well. So those are a few things I would say. The checkout experience, look at it on a mobile screen, make sure it's simple, 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 and don't try to be too cute. You know, don't make the checkout button where it says buy now, like spin and rotate. Oh, and don't forget those who can't see well, those who maybe have other disabilities or limitations as it were, whatever word you wish to use, be cognizant. You know, I have friends, a friend of mine who's, who's blind. She's a blind, blind writer, darn good writer. And she just, she re-educated me just a few days ago, things I was insensitive to. I'm not a mean guy, but I can see perfectly well. She can't. So she has to hear websites. And now when I put my images, you know, young kid drinking water, I type that in to the image. It makes me think of um, Eric Reese's brilliant book, The Lean Startup. And if you haven't read it, check it out. It's all about creating a minimal viable product before you spend a ton of money on products or websites or what have you. It's just a great way to experiment before wasting money. Um, so check that out. We're getting a few questions about TikTok and uh, Snapchat for business. What's your take? My name is Ramon. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Buy from me. Uh, oh, you, I thought you said do TikTok or about no. <laughs> um, so yes. That's <laughs> TikTok or Snapchat. Listen, where are your customers? If you're being pulled in the direction, you got to do TikTok, Dad. You got to do TikTok, Mom. And you know your customers are not there. Say thank you. Not today. I really mean that because we can get pulled. However. If you find you have a user base, often it's younger people, I would say try it out, but I would just be careful because right now, from what I can see, it's often bigger brands like you hear, Coca-Cola spent $40 million to do a Coca, uh, you know, a TikTok graduation. They can do things like that. But for most of us, very smaller ones, unless you have your audience there, it's tough. And don't forget about Pinterest. Pinterest is still, we don't hear about it a lot, but it's growing. And my friend Anita Campbell, Small Biz Trends, she reminded me, the sites that where you can click and go to a site are also, I think, the ones you want to take action because the other ones are really just brand building, if you get what I mean. So I'm a firm believer in lead collection and clicks. If I can't do that, I like Instagram. It's nice. I still use it. But you still, unless you have a certain amount of uh, users, you can't click and go somewhere. So just keep that in mind as you're examining these platforms. But brand building is important. It's just, you know, I'd rather have a Facebook video where people can click and come to my site or do something than just, it's cute because I'm on TikTok. I'm still wrapping my head around TikTok personally, but, but it is entertaining, um, but it's all about the sales. So Ramon, this has been incredible. Thank you for sharing your brilliant brain with us on marketing. Uh, I know we only have a few minutes. So one, do you have one universal piece of information that, or action steps that you want everyone here to walk away with? What's one piece of advice or tip that people should 
in, people should know. Absolutely. No, and thank you, Gabrielle, for having me. I really appreciate it. I've been honored to share this stage with you. But I would say uh, don't, don't let perfection stop you from moving forward. That's the biggest thing I would say, Gabrielle. Perfection, perfection is good. It's good to be do things right. But if it stops you, we have no time to wait for perfect because it's not going to come. You just need to get out there, get dirty, be slapped in the face, be told, uh, Gabrielle, yeah, yeah, this, yeah. okay, great. We're going to do it again. We're going to keep doing it again. I don't mind that I have spinach in my teeth. I'm going to keep talking to you. Things like that. So I would say don't let perfection stop you. But Gabrielle, thanks for having me. Great to have you, Ramon. Thank you. Um, this has been incredible. Make sure you share this with everyone. Uh, we all learned so much. So thank you so much, Ramon. So everyone, uh, as I mentioned earlier, our next webinar on Wednesday will be centered around the path to reopening and, and what this could look like. So we'll be joined by Alex Burke and Lenore Horton, both of which are experts on this topic. So don't miss that. Make sure you register. Uh, make sure that you are staying up to date on the latest from ToriBirchFoundation.org. Our tool is there. We'll be sharing more information about the new SBA rulings for loan forgiveness for PPP. So stay in touch. And make sure you check out our YouTube channel so you can rewatch all of this brilliant information from Ramon and take notes and write everything down. I know Ramon had so many tools that he shared today. So rewatch this video. And be well. Thanks, everyone, so much for joining. Give us your feedback. We're designing around your feedback. And thanks again. Take care.